going to be kind of in two parts. Uh, we're going to talk first about the history of the war itself to a certain degree. It's going to be abbreviated. Uh, I've got enough notes here for an hour and a half, so we're going to have to be skipping around here quite a bit. But that'll be the first part, and then after that, we'll talk about the actual veterans organization. I want to kind of just mention in the beginning here, I've got a bibliography and print it out. If someone would like to look at it afterwards, I'll put it on the table here. Uh, this is where I'm getting all of these things I'm going to be saying. There's a, a lot of books on here that are have been out quite a long time. Uh, Ross and Haynes had a few books out that they reprinted. Some of the old classics, one of them from 1916. The... John M. Holt had a book that came out in 53 or something like that. Uh, these are all books that are, are available. I think it's pretty much everywhere yet. I want to really recommend a book called The Last Full Measure by Richard Knoll. Richard uh, came out with that in 61, and he used a lot of letters and a lot of newspaper accounts. So you get a lot of primary sources and it really fills in a lot of the details that the more official accounts don't get into. Really a great book. Uh, unfortunately, we've got at least three authors here tonight, book authors, that know way more about this than I do. A couple of them sitting over here in the front row. But uh, hopefully I won't make too many mistakes as we go through here. I don't see Steve Anderson here. Steve didn't make it. Steve was... Uh, was the uh, Ross and Haynes man for many, many years and, and published books. He said he was coming over, but uh, hasn't made it at least yet. So I'm always a little bit nervous talking about soldiers, especially combat soldiers, because I was never in combat. I was never even really a, a real soldier. So I'm always, always a little bit nervous about speaking for them. I did spend a couple of years in a fairly tough military academy in the Shenandoah Valley back in the 60s. So I did learn a lot more than I wanted to about regulations and living in barracks and living with comrades and other ones that weren't so much comrades and the uniforms, the marching and all that stuff. So I, I do relate to that part of the uh, military experience. But on the other hand, when it comes to the combat, I don't know a thing about it. I just know what I read. And uh, these guys from the 1st Minnesota and Company B, they saw about the worst of the worst during the Civil War, as we'll see here in a few minutes. I did have five members in the Civil War from my extended family. Four of them were in Pennsylvania units. They were uh, Sixth Corps, most of them, and uh, high casualty units. Every one of them was grievously injured or had their lives shortened by the war. My Irish ancestor, he lasted about four months at Camp Chase Gazette and then went out on disability. He was in his 40s, and you really didn't want to be in your 40s in the Civil War as a soldier unless you were a very unusual, very hardy person. My interest in the Civil War, like a lot of guys, goes back to the 50s and the uh, Civil War Centennial, 1961, when that came around. I don't know why I found it interesting, but I can remember back in the first grade when I saw all those pictures of those soldiers. There was just something about it. I was a reenactor in the first Minnesota volunteer infantry here that was started in 1973, and it's still going. We just had a 50-year reunion not long ago. Uh, that was based at historic, I guess it's still based at historic Fort Snelling to some degree. Uh, we learned a lot about Civil War gear and about living outside a little bit and the conditions and how limited that gear was. We learned a lot about the weapons and that kind of thing. On the other hand, we didn't have to deal with what Richard Moe talks about as the terror and the strangeness of war. So again, uh, we just kind of got down to the basics of what life was like in the military. But we did learn a lot. We did a lot of movies and uh, all kinds of reenactments around the country. And there are things that made it real for us in a lot of ways. So 
So who were these people that were in Company B? When the Civil War, well, before the Civil War even got going, there was a group from Stillwater called the Stillwater Light Guards. And they were a militia group. This is fairly common in the state of Minnesota. There were eight militia groups in the different uh, towns throughout the state. Winona, uh, St. Anthony, St. Paul. Stillwater had its own group. This is the first announcement of that group getting together. They had a so-called armory down on Main Street. And has anyone ever heard where that was located? Because I haven't been able to find anything on that whatsoever. I think it was down by the old Minnesota house somewhere, but never any reference to it. This was their first meeting. There ended up being about somewhere between 20 and 40 people in that militia group. <coughs> they were really more of a social group than they were anything else. They did parades and had social gatherings. Kind of a pseudo-National Guard, but not too terribly serious at that point. This is another reference I found about them. This is one thing where they got a little bit of excitement. There was a riot in downtown Stillwater. <laughs> Apparently, there were a bunch of unpaid young men. And I assume they were loggers from the river work here. And they came downtown and started raising cane, and the police couldn't quite handle it, so they called out the Stillwater Lake Guards, and they promptly took care of the situation. They ended up taking these guys down to the territorial prison and depositing them down there. So that was their first, their first campaign. This is typical of the events that they would have done as a parade. It's, this particular one was in celebration of Bunker Hill. Just a gala type of festival thing, marching around, giving speeches, et cetera, et cetera. They had an artillery unit here, too, in town. They had a brass band from Afton. Now, this event, this got them their second campaign, as far as I can tell. And Steve Osmond over here told me about this. I never even heard about this event. It became known as the Wright County War. And there was, it's kind of a complicated story, but there were some lynchings and a few murders out there in the county. Things kind of got out of control, some mob violence back and forth. And the governor would not have it. So he got together, I believe, three maybe militia groups, I think two from St. Paul, as I recall, and then the Stillwater Guard and sent them out there. Uh, it kind of, from what I read, the little bit I read about it so far, it was a little bit more ceremonial than it was anything. There was no great violence that came of it. I guess the people were, the uh, rioters were maybe intimidated by the soldiers. They were armed, after all. And things kind of petered out. And the newspapers afterwards, kind of, uh, some of them at least made fun of some of what went on, kind of criticized the officers. And the governor came in for quite a bit of criticism for this event, but uh, he felt that was his duty to take care of things. This is a little bit more detail. The women breathe easier out there in the county. <laughs> There's a long account about this that uh, you can find online, too, as all kinds of different things happen. And here we see the journalist saying it was kind of a wild goose chase overall, cost quite a bit of money. Now, Steve also sent me this thing on Friday night. This is apparently the only existing photograph of these militia groups out in the field. Um, Steve, I guess you said you thought Company A was probably out in front there and Company B perhaps in back in the next row. 
Obviously, the picture is very blurred. It'd be really interesting if we could see more of what these uniforms look like, what their gear look like. They probably, at least some of them, maybe, I don't know how many, I, I haven't had time to go over all that, but some of them were carrying the Model 1855 rifle musket, which was state-of-the-art at the time. The interesting thing to me about the, <clears throat> that particular weapon was that it used roll caps to fire it, just like we had its kids in the 50s, and maybe they still have them in the 60s, 70s, I don't know. But the roll caps, that's how they use these things to fire them off. Interestingly enough, they were they came into being through the efforts largely of the head of the War Department back in 1855-56, who happened to be Jefferson Davis. <laughs> and we'll uh, hear a little bit more about him a little later on. So, after the Mexican War in the 1840s, there was a lot of territories, new lands that were obtained by the United States. This led to a lot of fighting over how those lands would be used in the 1850s. There was a lot of controversy about whether or not slavery would go into the territories or not. Uh, there were days of heated rhetoric, a lot of hatred, hatred of the national government, growing violence, places like Kansas particularly. Imagine, imagine something like that happening. William Faulkner said, the past is never dead, it's not even past. And, uh, he had that right for sure. Actually, the, the issue of slavery, we've heard lately too about, was the Civil War caused by slavery? Uh, kind of an absurd thing to even be hearing about anymore. But beyond that, uh, the real point of controversy back then to make a finer point on it was that a lot of people, the slave owners, wanted to expand slavery, not only keep it where it was, but they wanted to expand it into the territories. And that got people opposed to that completely up in arms, and things just kept heating up until eventually it came to literally war. Lincoln became, pre became the candidate for the new Republican Party that was found in Wisconsin. Pretty soon, the rhetoric and the violence heated up and Fort Sumter got fired on April 12, 1861. More or less by accident, Governor Alexander Ramsey from Minnesota was in Washington on lobbying business and he heard about the fact that there was going to be troops called up, so he ran up to the War Department talked to Mr. Cameron up there at the head and offered a thousand men to help put down the insurrection, the rebellion. And that was actually a part of the day before that official announcement even went out to the nation. So Minnesota was literally the first place, brand new state practically, to offer troops to go to the war. And the idea was that they were going to serve for three months. They wanted, Lincoln wanted 75,000 troops. They figured three months would be plenty of time to put down the insurrection. <laughs> so the 1,000 men that were offered by Governor Ramsey, that would constitute what was considered a regiment at the time, regiments from 900,000 men, something like that. It would be made out of 10 different companies, 90 to 100 men in each company. The companies in Minnesota were drawn from different areas in the state. As I said earlier, St. Paul had a couple, uh, Winona and Faribault. From these areas, they would fill up a company of 100 men and get them into this regiment, and it became the first Minnesota. Company B ended up being mostly based on the Stillwater Light Guard, people who had been in the militia. And they were from the Stillwater area, mostly. The men in there, the men and boys, there were a lot of loggers, people involved in the lumber trade. There were trappers, tradesmen, students, all kinds of other jobs were represented there. There were 16 persons of Swiss ancestry. There were 18 German ancestry, 14 Scandinavians, five Irish. And according to one account I read, it said the rest were Americans. 
The average age was about 25, 26, and none of them were born in Minnesota. The recruits were gathered out of Fort Snelling, which had been built mostly in the 1820s. They got out there on April 29th. The fort wasn't in the greatest of shape. It hadn't been used for military purposes for a while. There were apparently sheep grazing out there. Buildings were run down. Company B, I read in one source, went out by a wagon that was in by the author, Holcomb. Uh, another place it said that they marched out to the fort 30 miles. Those might have been two different occasions. I'm just not really clear on, on what that meant. Once they got out there to the fort, they were given a cursory exam by one Dr. Stewart. And it sounded very cursory from what I've read. Uh, there were no uniforms available yet. So they were given a blanket, stockings, and some flannel shirts, most of which apparently were red in color. <clears throat> on May 9th, the state of Minnesota furnished black trousers, hats, flannel shirts, some more flannel shirts, except for the Winona Company, who had their own uniforms that were made by citizens down there, and they happened to use gray for a color. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong with that? <laughs> this uh, photograph up here, this just shows the first Minnesota reenacting group, a little contingent, small contingent. I don't even know what year this is, uh, but this is sort of gives you a pretty good idea of what those red uniforms would have looked like. I suspect there would have been mixed color, other colors mixed in there at the time, too. These are some of the real soldiers that were in the first Minnesota from Stillwater area. Adam Marty in the left down there, he became kind of a prominent citizen here and uh, did all kinds of things around Stillwater, spent his life here. He was very prominent in the veterans' affairs after the war as well. If you uh, are so inclined, uh, the gentleman over here in the front row has written a great book on the first Minnesota and he has a section in there showing these soldiers, this is where I got, I think, most of the pictures or all of them. And if you want to look up an interesting character, get a hold of that book and look up Albert Sieber. Siebers, I think it's pronounced. He's shown down here on the right. This guy had quite a life. I'm not going to go into it at all, but his uh, Civil War service was intense like the rest of them. But afterwards, he just went on and did all kinds of amazing things and got involved with the Apache Nation and other Indian tribes and... Uh, all kinds of things. I read a newspaper account that he was shot to death by some desperado. Uh, but when you look in the real story in the book, you find, well, no, I actually found another spot. He was killed by a boulder that, that rolled over the cliff when he was working some kind of surveying job. So a little less dramatic, but no less terrible. <laughs> when I was working on this project, uh, over the last three months, one day after I'd done about maybe 70% of it, I got an email from a person I, I never heard of. His name is Brian Murphy. Um, for some crazy reason, he chose to be in Hawaii tonight instead of being here. But you know, I, So I still haven't gotten to meet him. But he emailed me out of the blue, and he had apparently talked to Emily here and knew this talk was coming. He said, oh, did you know that uh, the original notes from the uh, last man's club still exists mm -hmm. along with biographies of just about everybody in the group i'd never heard of that at all but anyway i went online and there it was this is uh, shows the cover i've got a uh, just a real little facsimile up there with some pages out of the book just to give you an idea it's, it was larger it's about this big just an unbelievable book with a wealth of knowledge about all these different soldiers' lives and what they did before the war and during the war as well. So we've got these guys out at Fort Snowing. They were sworn in to serve for three months in April. And uh, everybody thought the war was going to be over pretty fast. And a lot of them were really concerned they were going to miss the war if they didn't get there on time. 
Then on May 7th, it uh, suddenly was told to them, actually, we didn't mean three months, where it's going to be three years. <laughs> so some of the boys from Company B left, but 62 out of 80 of them did stay and did sign up for the three years. It's got to be a big controversy later on, too. So there were about 950 of them out there at this point at the fort, approximately. They did lots of drill, a lot of marching out there. They actually got housed in a barn because there wasn't room in, enough for the uh, some of the barracks that were run down. On May 28th, there was announced, announced that several companies, including Company B, would be going out to Fort Ridgely, Ripley, and Abercrombie to relieve the second U.S. Army troops that were out there that were going to go to the war front. They were not happy that about this at all, the company B boys didn't sign up to be at frontier forts. And again, some of them thought they were going to miss the war. That'd be a terrible thing. But uh, after some serious political lobbying, the first was ordered to Washington on June 14th. On June 22nd, they embarked at Fort Snowing on steamboats War Eagle and Northern Bell. They went to St. Paul where they loaded offloaded on the upper landing. They paraded through town in St. Paul, got back on the boats at the lower landing, and then went on down the river. We reenacted this in our first Minnesota group somewhere, I think, in the mid-'80s. I really don't remember. It was a long time ago. Really a haunting event to get actually go down the landing, get on the boats, get out to St. Paul. It really gave you a feeling, you know, this is where that happened. And these guys had really, in a way, no idea what they were uh, headed toward. They got trains down in La Crosse and Prairie du Chien to go out to the actual war front out east. It was a big deal for a lot of the guys who had never maybe been on trains much. It's kind of a big adventure at this point. They had receptions along the way, a lot of bands, a lot of girls waving their handkerchiefs. Sounded pretty good until they got to Baltimore, and the people there in Baltimore were very quiet, very sullen along the streets, and uh, the men actually went through town with loaded muskets and bayonets because a troop of uh, First Massachusetts had been attacked before that in Baltimore, but nothing really happened. They got to Washington, and they went into camp around the U.S. Capitol building about half a mile away. I want to mention at this point a fellow named Edward Stevens from Company B. He was 23 years old. He was a correspondent for the Stillwater Messenger. His uh, nom de plume was uh, raisins, and he wrote back many accounts of life in the regiment. Once they got into the battles, he talked about that. Really an interesting guy to uh, check out if you feel like it. The uh, Stillwater Messenger newspapers are online. They're very accessible. They're completely fascinating. If you have any question about the war being about slavery, read the Messengers in the, in the 1850s. It's mentioned a lot. And uh, that was a Republican newspaper at the time. But uh, people here were very aware of slavery as an issue. Raisins got in a lot of trouble. He even got arrested. He ruffled the feathers of the War Department, Edwin Stanton. Uh, he was arrested by Winfield Scott eventually for sedition because he was disputing the three-month, three-year deal that had happened. Uh, and he was just a very outspoken. He was really quite a character, really well looking, worth looking up those newspaper articles about him. There were other correspondents from home news, town, uh, hometown newspapers as well. I'm not going to go into those, but uh, the book by uh, Richard Mole really uses a lot of quotes for them. It's really a great source, and you get a real good idea of what things were like in the ranks. So they're in Washington. On July 7th, Raisin talks about how enthusiastic they are. Things are looking pretty good. First week in July, the troops are moved by steamship to Alexandria. They're moving toward the front now. They were so excited about it, they put on a, what he called an authentic Indian war dance. 
So they were really ready for what one of them actually in the newspaper is called ready for the fun. Which brings us up to the Battle Bull Run. And uh, this is where the fun ends. On July 18th, Captain Bromley, Company B, resigns. Lieutenant Mark Downey takes over. A and B companies were sent out five miles on reconnaissance. And this brought them right up to the rebel lines. On July 21st, the 1st Regiment was awakened at 1 a.m., according to Raisins. He complains that some of the regiments were awakened at 2 o'clock, some of them at 5 o'clock, some of them at 6 o'clock. Right away, you've got chaos there in the organization. The 1st Minnesota, according to him, was made to stand in place for about five hours, not moving, while the generals and officers tried to get things going. Uh, it very quickly got hot that day. It was 90 degrees, whatever. They didn't. They ran out of water pretty fast. They were thirsty. They ended up hurrying up and then waiting. So it was a pretty miserable thing to start with. Raisins mentions that most of the men got nothing to eat that morning at all, and many of the men had not eaten the day before either. As they get up to the front, of the battle line there at Bull Run, they hear cannon fire. Pretty soon they're seeing dead horses and men in a battery, gunfire all around them. Stonewall Jackson's <clears throat> brigade had a regiment in it, the 4th Alabama, that was marching up toward them really close. And guess what? They were wearing red shirts. <laughs> so the men in the 1st Minnesota were told not to fire on their friends. The 4th uh, Alabama got up nice and close, raised their muskets, and 30 men went down, killed and wounded, including four in the color guard. The whole day was a advance and retreat, a lot of chaos on the battlefield back and forth, and all that ended in utter disaster, a terrible, re <coughs> excuse me, terrible retreat back toward Washington. So this was their initiation into the war itself, the real war. Raisin said in his initial report that there were 25,000 Union troops and the rebels had at least 100,000 troops. And of course, that was not true at all. He also mentions there that he hoped only 150 out of 900 of them engaged would have been killed and wounded. He mentions that Corporal Sam Bloomer got his, quote, head chiseled unquote, for two inches by a rebel buckshot. Afterwards, exhausted and demoralized, they remain unpaid. They have no uniforms yet. Generals are getting blamed for what happened. Colonel Gorman gets criticized. There's factions on both sides. Some like him, some hate him. Uh, soon after that, they are sent out briefly to the Shenandoah Valley, trying to chase down Stonewall Jackson, but they Confederates retreated up the valley, and so there was no battle there. They also camped at the historic Harper's Ferry on that little campaign. From there, they went into camp, a place called Camp Stone in Maryland. And that was really a fairly decent thing. They were there about five months. Those were probably the brightest days for these fellows trying to recuperate after all the chaos of Bull Run. I'm not going to talk much more about any battles, just very briefly, the campaigns that they faced in 1862 included the, Pencil, the Peninsula Campaign, which was fought in the Virginia swamps in the spring and summer. It sounds completely miserable. It was hot. It was wet. One of the amazing things to me about Civil War soldiers was the nature of their equipment, because they had to be wet all the time. This is before waterproof clothing and decent tents. They were given tents, but they were just barely adequate. I think they were five, six inches long, something like that. They had no floor in them. They had no end flaps. Each soldier was given half a tent, and at night they would button them together, and then they'd have one tent. But again, it was better than nothing. It was uh, some shade, but when it's going to rain, you're going to get probably wet. The Peninsula Campaign, for the most part, was another disaster. A lot of uh, poorly organized situations, 
Uh, they ended up retreating back to Washington. They got within a few miles of Richmond, which was their objective. But again, they were defeated. And uh, they ended up being part of the rear guard there again, too. So there had to be a lot of demoralization at this point. The next event they got involved in in September was the Battle of Antietam, which was one of the worst battles of the whole war at this time. Um, and the casualty lists and numbers, they do vary here and there, but it looks to me like they had about 147, 150 casualties out of, at that time, 435 in the, in the ranks. Uh, a regiment had 1,000 people, ideally, or 900 people, but Civil War units were constant. They would dwindle very rapidly. It was far more typical there'd be 300 or 400 guys in the, in the ranks. They were always recruiting at the same time if they could, so numbers go up and down. But at Antietam, these numbers sound good. This is out of the book by Lochran, an account by Lochran, 147 casualties out of 435. The first Minnesota was spared at the next one of the next major battles at Fredericksburg. They did not get involved in the suicidal attacks there. Uh, a lot of men froze to death on the ground, wounded after that battle. It was another absolute disaster, poorly organized, very poor generalship. Right along, generals in the Union Army are being replaced. They get new ones, place them again, on and on this goes. But at Fredericksburg, they were lucky. They didn't get put into the direct attack. They were also spared at Chancellorsville, where they were in the reserve. There they had nine men wounded only. My great-grandfather and, and his uh, brother, they were in the 49th Pennsylvania Volunteers. They were right next to the 1st Minnesota here at Chancellorsville. And that brings us up to Gettysburg. And I'm not going to really talk about Gettysburg at all. You've probably heard the accounts, whatever. But after a terrible, long, hard march, they got there on the second day. The traditional numbers appear to me to be that there were 47 guys left out of 262 at the famous charge. So you're looking at 70, 80% casualties. The numbers on that do vary some. On July 2nd, <clears throat> out of a, well, and this is, gets kind of complicated, but on July 2nd, they lost some more men, 55 more casualties, 23 killed in action or mortally wounded. <clears throat> and I found an account here it's actually, uh, we're going to see it a little bit later on here. This is out of the biographies and the notes in the, uh, the book for the club. This guy here somehow went through the whole war with the first Minnesota and was never even wounded. And this was in the, the uh, biography notes book, Mr. Fallahy. This article is about, I think it was, I think it was 1907, it might have been 1902. But at the very bottom, it says, Mr. Fallahy was one of the survivors at Gettysburg. He was the only survivor on the right of his company, Company B. There were, he says there were 36 men, losing 30 of them killed or wounded. So Company B, after Gettysburg, basically had six men standing. That's what was left. Now, people came and went. There Sometimes there'd be people that were missing or on detail or something. They'd come back. But this gives you an idea of what Company B was up against. They were just basically decimated. And that was pretty much the end of the war. For the first Minnesota, they did have a couple more campaigns, Bristol Station and uh, Mine Run. The Mine Run thing, all I want to say about that is it was unbelievable. They had the first Minnesota survivors ready to go for a, a dawn assault on a heavily fortified trenches, cannons, Confederates all over the place. These guys spent the night in the cold trying to keep their hands and feet from freezing on them waiting for an assault the next day that they knew would be suicidal. Uh, or the one account I read in the newspaper, the guy said, if we knew that if we, they sent us in, we'd all die. Some of them had written their names or addresses on their uh, uniforms pinned to it. 
so they can be identified afterwards. And at the last minute, a general, General Warren, got to the general meet and said, this would be crazy, let's not do it, and he called it off. So an incredibly dramatic end to the first Minnesota. And that was the war record. So, we're going to move now to the last man's club. I don't know, Emily, I guess I... Which one are you looking for? I must have switched. Okay. There we go. So the soldiers came back. They took up their lives in the different trades and businesses they had. At some point, a few of them got together, reminiscing, I suppose, about the war of the veterans. The first meeting that they had was here noted in their notes, September 17th, 1885, 20 years after the war. The guys who attended the meeting are listed there. There's just a few of them. This was to commemorate the Battle of Antietam in 1862. Uh, there were 43 survivors at this time out of the original regiment. And 14 of them actually showed up with the guests. At the very end of this banquet, they decided that they're going to make this a regular thing. So they started taking notes. A gentleman named Adolphus Hospice offered to donate a large and commodious bottle of wine for toasting every year at the banquets that they were planning to have. That original bottle is over here in the case. That's from the Warden's House collection. There's a cast, a wooden cast that was made about the, at the same time. How is that? The names of the deceased veterans and dates are on the bottle in hand at, at the end. If you're welcome to come up and take a look at that. Every year they use that to make a toast, and they use that right up to 1930. The first veteran to die in this group died on September 1888. His name was William Morgan. He was captured at Antietam, and his empty chair was draped in black. And from then on, every time one of the veterans passed away, they would drape an empty chair in black. So every year, there would be more of those chairs. The years went by. By 1927, there were only three members left, Peter Hall, John Goff and Charles Lockwood, 86. And that's these gentlemen here. This is 1927. They decided that it was kind of a sad thing to leave this till there's only one person left. So they decided that the three of them would drink a toast this time together. Mr. Goff struggled to his feet. They all drank the toast and they discovered the wine that turned to vinegar. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Lockwood, who was quoted in the newspaper, said later, quote, we should have taken a bottle of good Irish whiskey. It would be really oily by now. <laughs> the wine bottle was corked, went back to a bank vault where it was kept. And the Stillwater Library Association was going to take over these artifacts when they passed. In 1928, for the first time, the Last Man's Club met outside Stillwater in St. Paul at Mr. Goff's home. He'd be unable to travel. Lockwood drove all the way from his home in South Dakota. This is 1928. He drove from South Dakota to Minnesota. Mr. Goff was nearly blind and deaf in the wheelchair. And according to this newspaper account, one of the reporters asked him if he was going to be coming back next year. And he said, quote, why sure, God damn it. <laughs> next year and the next. We're all good for a smart piece yet. And as we told the boys in 86, we'll always meet as long as we shall live, unquote. The following August, Mr. Goff passed away. Mr. Hall followed him in April of 1930. 
Charles Lockwood was informed, but he said he would come back to Stillwater next year. So in next, the next year, Mr. Lloyd Colliner, commander of the Stillwater American Legion, Post 48, drove out to Chamberlain, South Dakota, South Dakota picked up Mr. Lockwood for the July 21 anniversary, 1930. This time there were 33 empty chairs draped in black, each one with the name of a Company B soldier on a white ribbon. Four people were seated at the banquet table, Mr. Lockwood, Mrs. Helen McClure, president of the Stillwater Library Association, Mrs. Nellie Bloomer, only surviving widow of the last man club member, Samuel Bloomer, and Ella Staples, who was the secretary of the Minnesota Territorial Prisoners Association. A squad of National Guardsmen stood behind the table. The flag of Company B was on the wall. VFW, American Legion, and U.S. flags were behind them, and a crowd of spectators stood in the hall. The roll call was read by Mr. Staples. Thirty-three names in silence until Charles Lockwood answered, present. The bottle was given to Mr. Lockwood, and he read a poem that was composed way back in 1886, I believe it was, and uh, we're going to see that in the film that's coming soon here. There were members of the Associated Press, Twin Cities newspapers took photos, the movie tone news crew was there and recorded on what they called talking film, the end of the only club of its kind in the world. You'll see Mr. Lockwood in this film, it's going to last about five and a half minutes, raising his glass and salute for the last toast. And we'll now have the film. I hear no answer to my call. The glasses stand filled to the brim. From out the sky upon the wall, no shadow falls of face or limb. Turn out the lights. The feast is o'er. No answer to my calling comes. I stand beside a fast-closed door. My pulses beat like muffled drums. The campfire smolders. Ashes fall. The clouds are black athwart the sky. No tap of drum. No bugle call. My comrades, all goodbye.
The person at the back of our disorder has been custodian of this bottle of wine since its presentation to this club. Yeah, uh, July 21st, 1986. And as official of the bank, I now deliver this to Mr. Lockwood, the last survivor, come to me from West Minnesota. Oh, here's this closure. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lockwood, take hand. Thank you. Charlie, here's a letter from Mrs. McClure. Mrs. McClure, that is from your class to be delivered over to the library. And you're handed to Mr. Pierce. I have to put it in, uh, in the care of the prints of the bank until there's a place, proper place provided. We have no place that will receive just now. We expect to have one very soon. I thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lockwood and guests of the Last Man's Club, it gives me great pleasure to bring you officially the greeting of all of the people of the city of Stillwater. Stillwater is always held in the deepest reverence and with the most loving thoughts, its soldier population. Uh, at the last regular session of our city council, we adopted the following resolution, which I want to read for you and which I want to present to you and have you preserve. In that, uh, res resolved by the council of the city of Stillwater, that in view of the fact that the final annual banquet of the last man's club will be held on July 21st, 1930. The mayor and members of the council, as the official representatives of the citizens of our city, deem it an honor and a privilege to proclaim to the world their admiration and reverence for those 101 gallant young men and boys of Stillwater and Washington County who, 69 long years ago, promptly responded to the call of the immortal Lincoln for volunteers to fight in defense of the Union in the Civil War by enlisting in Company B of the 1st Minnesota Volunteer Infantry at Fort Snelling, composed of men whose fighting qualities, daring, and bravery in battle made them famous the world over. 